Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us here this evening. Uh, it's wonderful to see such a great group of devoted uh, people here interested in learning about the important topic of historic preservation and conservation, which is a topic near and dear to our heart here at Telfair Museums. I'm Lisa Grove, Director and CEO, and it's a real pleasure to welcome you to this talk called The History of Preservation at the Owens Thomas House. It may be hard to believe, but the Owens Thomas House and the Telfair Academy, the Telfair Mansion, are both coming up on their 200th birthdays in 2019. We'll be celebrating the completion of both of those historic properties that year. And as many of you who have old houses are aware, old houses take a lot of TLC. Uh, constant care and maintenance are needed to keep our important historic properties beautiful. The Owens Thomas House entered Telfair's collection in the 1950s as a bequest from Margaret Gray Thomas, and we've been caring for it for over 60 years. Over that time, a lot of work has been done to preserve and restore this incredible building to its Regency splendor, both inside and out. And this hard work is ongoing, and it's, in fact, it's getting important national recognition. As some of you may have heard, we had very exciting news to announce this summer. We recently received a major $250,000 grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities towards the next phase of the Owens Thomas House restoration project, which focuses much needed attention on the basement of the main house, as well as the slave quarters in the carriage house. And hot off the press just this week, uh, we learned that we have received a second grant for $250,000 from the Letty Pate Evans Foundation in Atlanta. So yay! That foundation is part of the Coca-Cola um, money, so keep drinking Coca-Cola. <laughs> We're thrilled to be here in Georgia uh, benefiting from that. Uh, but these two major gifts go a long way towards our goal of raising money for this really, really important project. And we couldn't be more honored to be able to bring, it, um, bring this next phase to completion over the next year. Um, we've got lots of um, related educational programs. We'll be working on a symposium and a related publication uh, related to all the work that we're doing. So I encourage all of you to stay tuned. We will have exciting news um, over the next year. And of course, if any of you are interested in learning more about the project and financially supporting this important work, uh, see me afterwards. Um, we'd be happy to, to talk to you about that. And speaking of which, after this talk, I do want to make sure to invite all of you to stick around and join us for a reception hosted by the Friends of the Owens Thomas House. The FOT, as we lovingly call them, is such an important support group of the museum. And it has raised literally hundreds of thousands of dollars over the years to support many of the preservation projects you will hear about tonight. Telfer Museums could not maintain our two historic sites without the generous and thoughtful support of all of our members, particularly the FOT. I know many of you are members of the FOT, board members who are here with us tonight, and I want to thank you. So please, everyone, join me in thanking the FOT for all of this. <laughs> so now on to our program. Tonight, you will have the pleasure of hearing from three members of the Telfair Museum staff who collectively are charged with preserving and sharing the history of our buildings with the world. We're truly fortunate to have such experienced and dedicated staff here at the museum, and I know you're gonna be fascinated by their presentations this evening. So here's how it will go. We'll start off first hearing from Sonia Wallen, and she has served as Telfair's buildings curator for the last five years. She'll give us an overview of the many preservation conservation and restoration projects that have taken place at the Owens Thomas House, really over the whole time that it's been part of Telfair Museums. Next, we'll hear from Jason Cobb, our Assistant Buildings Curator, who will have a little cameo to speak about the preservation projects from the house, about the house's interior spaces. And then finally, our talk will conclude with a few brief remarks from our Curator of History and Decorative Arts, Shannon browning Mollis, who will, conclude, who will talk a little bit about some of the upcoming projects that we're working on. So you're in for a real treat. So thank you so much for being here with us tonight. And please join me in welcoming our building's curator, Sonia Wallen. Thank you, Lisa.
A scene from the past was reenacted last night as guests thronged the gracious rooms of the Owens Thomas House, gleaming with candlelight that was reflected in the crystal sconces and tall mirrors. The home was strikingly beautiful, restored to its original architectural splendor. It's an article from Savannah Morning News in April of 1954, the home's grand opening as a museum. This presentation was suggested after I corrected a coworker when they referred to the Owens Thomas House Reinterpretation Project that we're currently working on as a restoration. I said, we're not restoring it, we're conserving it. This begged the question, what's the difference? What's been done at the Owens Thomas House? That would make a really good presentation. So moral of the story, be careful who you correct. <laughs> but here we are tonight. Thank you all for your curiosity, for being here. Um, as with so many simple questions, the answer is not so simple. But this presentation is my take on the subject, framed within the context of the preservation movement and the history of the Owens Thomas House as Savannah's first historic house museum. We'll review select elements of the site I mean, it was really difficult to pick what we were going to talk about, um, but I'm just going to touch on a few things so that we're not here for a week, uh, because it's a long history of restoration and preservation at the site. Um, we'll talk about how they've been treated since that time of the grand opening in 1954. I'll be, as Lisa said, enlisting the help of Jason Cobb, uh, Telford Museum's Assistant Buildings Curator, to talk about the uh, interior spaces. So I open with this interesting image of the Owens Thomas House from the late 19th century. It's one of the earliest images we have of the home, and it's an informative point of reference that I'll refer back to during the presentation. I wanted to start with a quick review of history, uh, the history of historic preservation in Savannah and the Low Country to remind us of how this fairly new profession and associated jargon came to be. In doing this research, I was reminded that in 1931, Charleston, just up the road, started the nation's first historic district. But Savannah wasn't far behind. In 1939, the Society for Preservation of Savannah Landmarks was established. And in the 1940s, the Habersham House, now known as the Pink House, was restored and turned into a restaurant. This is a great example of adaptive reuse, something we'll talk more about later. During the 1940s, a plan to pave through the squares on Habersham Street was thwarted by citizens who were already incensed by the elimination of squares on Montgomery Street. In 1949, the National Trust for Historic Preservation was established. And in 1951, Margaret Owens Thomas willed her home to the Telford Museum of Art. And after two or so years of, of work on the house, it opened at that grand op opening I just read read about. In 1955, the Historic Savannah Foundation, Inc. is formed and purchases the Davenport House, which was slated for demolition for a parking lot. In 1966, the National Historic Preservation Act was passed, and this established the National Register of Historic Places. And in the same year, the heart of downtown Savannah became the nation's largest historic landmark district. But among these successes, there were some losses. This is the Habersham Bullock House <coughs> and the U.S. Branch Bank. Uh, both these buildings were designed by uh, Owens Thomas House architect William Jay, the young architect from Bath, England, in the Regency style, and both were demolished in the 1920s. These buildings were recognized nationally for their exceptional design. Of course, City Market. Uh, this was a really a dramatic loss for the city. Uh, people were, were very distraught about it. Uh, the, the cultural, uh, it was a cultural heart of the city, so um, it was very devastating when it was torn down and turned into this parking lot, which probably most of you remember. It hasn't been long gone. Now where Ellis Square is. Uh, this, the, the demolition of City Market really inspired the preservation movement and the forming of the historic Savannah Foundation. And um, it also inspired the design of our current downtown Kroger. I don't know if you guys remember that this is what it was based on. Here is Savannah's Union Station. It was located on East uh, West Boundary Street, which is now uh, Martin Luther King Boulevard. And it was torn down for the I-16 overpass. What a beautiful building it was. 
and of course the DeSoto Hotel, which is now where the Hilton is on Liberty Street. It's a beautiful uh, Victorian Romanesque style building with a lot of ornamental, uh, ornamental terracotta. Um, it was just a very sad loss for the city. But the U.S. Thomas House really stood safe from this whirlwind of threats and losses. Margaret not Thomas knew her house was important. She received the attention of many architects who already referred to the home as the best example of architecture of its kind in the country. And it was also no secret that this is where Marquis de Lafayette stayed and spoke to Savannians in 1825. Her home was selected to be one of the first to be recorded in the American Building Survey um, HABS, which, which is now referred to, in uh, 1936. And this image is one of the drawings that the, the survey recorded. And it's a really interesting uh, drawing. It's a cross section of the house running east to west. And you can look, if you look in the basement here, there's the cistern, the ice chamber, which Jason called the manila envelope. <laughs> um, so it's a very unusual view of the building. But let's get back to the terms, the jargon that's made up of words of action that are now associated with the field of historic preservation. There are many, ranging from the academic conservation to the more colloquial and ever-present facelift. Savannah Morning was his favorite for title for restoration projects. And of course, my contractor's favorite, the redo. But I wanted to focus on what I feel, the ones that I feel carry the most weight. Preservation, conservation, restoration, and adaptive reuse. The work at the Owens Thomas House has employed each of these methods in abundance. But before we get to that, let's try to define some of these terms. So this gets a little dense. And in case you get bored, I'm giving you this really cool old slide to look at. I believe this is uh, taken right after the, uh, the home was turned into a museum. So. I'll dig into the, some of these terms real quick. I suspected in my research to define these terms that I would find some degree of academic debate. And boy, did I ever. It's very complicated. Uh, different countries have uh, their, their, their different ways of defining these terms. Um, the US Department of Interior has modified its definition of preservation three times in the past 20 years, and just uh, twice in like the past eight years. So clearly, this is a field that's in a state of flux. The 2016 definition states that preservation focuses on maintenance and repair of, ex of existing historic materials and the retention of a property's form as it has evolved over time. So a very delicate touch. The terms conservation and preservation are often used interchangeably. But the National Park Service defines conservation as the preservation of land while they define preservation as a, um, a, the protection of historic structures. But the word conservation is very prevalent in my world. We hire conservators who are specialists in often the highly technical approaches required to maintain a particular element of the build of a building. In fact, in 1992, the Owens Thomas House put forth a preservation philosophy drafted by architectural conservator George Ford. It reads as follows. Our preservation philosophy is that of conservation and protection. The key tenets of these preservation principles are, one, the, the um, conservation of all historic fabric, two, the preservation of evidence of all architectural changes, and three, the development of techniques for the maintenance and structural integrity of affected elements. And this is still very much how we approach the work we do at the Owens Thomas House, the Telfair Academy, and the Jepson Center today. Moving on to restoration, it's a little more clear cut. Most sources are in agreement with their definition as, of restoration as the editing or removing existing elements and replacing missing elements in order to represent a determined period of interpretation. So to decide what time period is the most important and edit the site to reflect that period. Some museums have done this to an extreme degree, eliminating decades of additions and modifications in order to recreate the look of a previous time that was deemed more important. Often these decisions are regretted down the road as sites later struggle to understand the full context and breadth of its history. 
Not to say restoration is bad. I think restoration is, is very much a necessity when, when you're talking about historic buildings, but we do need to be very thoughtful and careful about how we go about it. It can result in a kind of a sterile representation of a building. Adaptive reuse, um, adaptive reuse is simply the adapting of a historic structure whose original purpose is no longer viable for a new purpose. This approach, where the focus is typically more on the bottom line than on preserving all historic fabric, has allowed the preservation movement to become a mainstream success. So with that, this turns out of the way, let's shift our focus back to the Owens Thomas House. So what I notice when I look at this slide is you know, what are the things that we're dealing with today. First of all, I notice all the environmental deposit, the bi biological growth on the building. It's something that we still really struggle with. Um, when any time a building is shaded by trees, you get a lot of this, and it's still a problem with the Owens Thomas House. You have to clean them very sensitively, but fairly regularly. I'm still kind of figuring out what the appropriate timeline is for that. I also notice this corner, broken. We've repaired it just recently. It's an ongoing thing. This corner always is fractured and falling apart. There's also a crack right here, which you can barely make out. It's a, a crack that exists today. Uh, it's, these buildings have memory. They didn't build in expansion joints when they constructed these buildings like we do now. We have them all over the Jefferson Center. So the, the stress uh, finds the weakest point and re reoccurs kind of constantly over time, so they need to be readdressed. So considering the threats to downtown Savannah in the 1950s, Margaret Thomas was smart not to leave the future of her home up to chance. She prescribed her plan for adaptive reuse of her home and her will. This is what she, she writes. The home is to be given to the Telfer Museum of Arts and Sciences to be by it preserved, maintained, and used as a museum in perpetuity for the benefit and use of the public. When the home was accepted to the Telfair, discussions immediately ensued among the trustee members on how the home should be presented to the public. I was really surprised to learn that there was a debate this early on over the different types of building intervention and what they meant. In 1953, board minutes state that there's a few badly <coughs> needed repairs, but no restoration needed. In 1953, a supervising architect was hired to oversee renovations. In 1954, board meeting minutes discussed the restoration of the home to the Regency period. And in 1964, a document written by the building's first curator, Ms. Jane Adair Wright, states that the Owens Thomas House is a renovation, not a restoration. So like I said earlier, since its time as a museum, preservation, restoration, conservation, and adaptive reuse, and some historically accurate enhancements have been made. So let's start by looking at the interior, and I will turn the podium over to Jason Cobb, who will talk to you about the interior spaces. All right. Hello. All right. So I'm a huge <laughs> postcard collector of Savannah postcards, and this is uh, the postcard that you see over here to the left is actually a very early image of the Owens Thomas House, probably from the early 1960s. <coughs> um, and this is the dining room, of course. Um, right beside it, we have an image of the dining room as it looks today. But you can see a clear difference between the rooms. This is a great example of restoration. In the early 1950s, um, the articles that, we, that I read talked about different repairs that happened, in this room especially, there was uh, repairs to the ceiling, plaster, and they actually just repaired a few of the cornice pieces that you see around the top of the border up here. So the room was in relatively good shape. So again, it's a great example of restoration. Um, the early 1960s image, um, very interesting. The floor that you see right here is actually from the Owens period from around the 1880s. It's this beautiful two-tone floor. It's still there today. Um, but again, today, as time progressed in the museum, they wanted the room to reflect more closer to the Richardson era, the first occupants of the home. And so we did do, they did some investigation. They found tack marks where carpeting was in this room. They found remnants. And so they knew that the, the, the uh, in, and also the inventories indicated that these rooms were wall-to-wall -wall carpeted. So again, it's just all about being more accurate to the Richardson era. 
early on they wanted the Regency feel in the room. And so that's, the room is filled with um, uh, Telford pieces of uh, original to the, um, even the uh, Telford family. Um, we'll go on to another great example of uh, restoration is the drawing room. Again, another postcard coming from the 1960s, early 1960s of the drawing room here. This room was also in very good shape for the time period. They did plaster work in the ceiling. Um, and again, some window work. So they really talked about doing some minimal uh, work to the home to restore it. And they also wanted to restore it back to that era, that Regency era. Again, the image to your right over here is the room as it looks today with the wall-to-wall -wall carpeting. The draperies even go back to the Richardson era. They found bobbins and parts of draperies that had survived. And uh, those were uh, used to recreate the draperies that you see. So again, it's always a, a, again a going back to the more pure uh, Richardson era that you see right here. All right, one of my favorite um, uh, favorites to talk about in the show was this one: the adaptive reuse restoration. Um, very early on, in the early or the late 1950s, uh, a shop opened for the uh, uh, Owens Thomas. It was called the Regency Shop. And it was actually located in the rear of the house in the butler's pantry, which we show off today. The first um, image you see here is actually a postcard from the mid-1980s. And if you take a peek up right here in the window, you see these glass shelves with these dishes on them. That was the gift shop uh, for the time period. And over here, you can see that same window, but you're looking in uh, to the restored butler's pantry. So again, the um, the Owens Thomas House needed a place to have a shop. It also brought in profits for the museum, and it was very profitable. There's even records about that. Um, so again, they adapted to reuse the butler's pantry as a gift shop space. They removed a lot of the cabinets, that you, the cabinet doors that you see right here. Some of these were even cut in half. Uh, many of the doors were all taken off, and luckily for us, they took all those down and put them in the basement of the house, and they actually labeled them as well. Um, so, as me and Simon were going through all these, when we were restoring this room back to the way it looked around 1819, 1820, it was very, very helpful to have all of that. Um, the finish in the room is also taken back to that earliest uh, oak panel uh, feel or oak finish that you see right here. So, again, it's a double use of um, the methods that we use in historic preservation. All right, so the basement kitchens were very, very interesting uh, to do a little bit of research on the basement altogether. And what I found very, very interesting is the committees that were formed in the very earliest part uh, to do research on the Owens Thomas House knew immediately that the basements were very, very important. That's very unusual for Savannah um, house museums. Many of the house museums that we have um, today, the basements have been completely altered. There's office space, they're used for storage, but even in the early 1950s, uh, or the late 1950s, excuse me, uh, they, were, they knew that they wanted to use these areas for display and open to the public. So what you're seeing right here is a postcard from the early 1960s again. Um, and the area that they believed a kitchen was located, they even stated that they weren't 100% sure that this is where the kitchen was located. But they did it in an authentic manner, was the big term they used. Um, so you see all the furnishings, all, everything was of the period, so it's a great example of a Regency kitchen in the period. Then over here we have this area today. It's in transition uh, to, for the new interpretation. All right, and we're going back into the house, up right up to the top of the second floor. Um, conservation in the house. We use all the methods, again, very unusual. Uh, the second floor hallway, from when you get, go all the way upstairs, we have this little narrow hallway, and a lot of people find this very odd looking because a lot of the rooms have been restored. Um, but this room has a lot of evidence that's on the wall. These are called ghost marks, and uh, they're very important. Basically, they're markings of where things were once attached to the wall. So today we just keep this wall the way it was, and our guides talk about the different little rooms that were located in the space. This area was actually where the second floor plumbing was located. Uh, there was believed to be at least three separate chambers. One was a dressing room, one may have been a toilet room, and one may have been a sink room, and there may have been an additional room. So there's still a little bit of um, information that we need to do research on. But again, it's a great talking point on the tour. Right next to it um, is, our, is actually the real kitchen of the home. And this is a great example of conservation. If you can just walk into this space, the ghost marks are everywhere. You can see where shelving was attached to the room or to the walls. 
You can see where different ranges were used um, near the fireplace entrance. So it's a great area. It's actually one of the most uh, conserved spaces in um, house museums in Savannah. So very, very interesting. Another very interesting room in the house, uh, in the basement, is the wine room, which is not currently on view. But again, this is a postcard from the early 1960s. Um, and one of my biggest questions was, why did they call this the wine room? Is it, was it a wine room in the very beginning? And the answer is, it probably wasn't. It was probably used for many different commodities, like wine, sugar, rice, things like that, not just for wine. But when this room opened in the late 1950s, there was a huge lecture at the um, Telford Academy, and they were talking about, um, they actually invited the vice director of the New York State Historical Association to come in and talk about um, new trends in restoration. So wine rooms were apparently the latest trends in house <laughs> Um And his name was Frederick L. Wall, so a um, very important man. Uh, who you see here is Malcolm Bell in this article. It was in the Savannah Morning News. He had written a, an article about Madeira wine, which is very fashionable to talk about. And we have the director of the time of Telford right here. Um, his name was Robert Luck. And we have James Richardson, who's also um, on the board. So again, they're in the wine room at the time talking about how wine was made. It was just a very interesting part. So marketing comes into very, uh, is also important when uh, selling house museums. You have people have to come in and buy a ticket also. So again, that pretty much concludes my talk on the interiors. I'm going to hand it back over to uh, Solomon to continue talking about the stucco of the house. Thank you, Jason. So moving on to one of my favorite building elements, the stucco. Um, stucco is really what set the home apart among Savannah wood clabbered houses in the, 19, in the 1820s. And its warm color and imperfections that come with age continue to be a distinguishing and intriguing feature of the house today. Another cool slide for you guys to just look at while I talk. Um, the stucco is, was originally referred to as Roman cement, and it was reported, imported from Europe for construction of the Owens Thomas House. It is a natural lime-based masonry coating that provided uniformity in color and texture over the substrate, which in the case of the Owens Thomas House is tabby, cooking stone, and brick. It was also the most weather-resistant coating available in the early 19th century. Technically speaking, its breathability, the ability to let moisture escape, uh, is a critical characteristic for the preservation of both the interior and exterior surfaces. It's also important that repairs and patches to the stucco have that same quality. Before I leave the slide, I just want to, do you have the, yeah, go off topic just for a second. Well, uh, uh, this is a, an image from, like, from 1936, a, a historic American built building survey image. They took beautiful archival images of the home. And uh, again, you see all the biological deposits along the fence. Um, it's a couple other things that I noticed. There's some uh, finials missing along the fence here. This is still where Margaret Thomas lived in the house. One of the most interesting things that I noticed in this slide that I don't hear many people talk about and I haven't seen much written about is this coffered ceiling under the portico. Uh, and I don't know if this was original or an addition. Um, if it was original, I, I think it would be a really cool thing to restore, but I think it, it adds a really interesting, um, beautiful decorative element to the house. I think that's all. So let's move on to the stucco repair. So this is just a random image from a part of the house. And if you guys, if, if anybody here knows the house intimately, maybe you'll be able to guess where this is from. But it's just a really great example of all the different um, stucco patches that have occurred over time. I think we have probably an example of four or five different patches. This kind of mocha color here is the original stucco. And then here's a patch. These two seem to be the same period. This is later, I think this is different. And then all of this has a completely different texture. So it's trying to match this original stucco, obviously, but it's just really amazing. Their attention to detail, the level of documentation and recorded research is just, just amazing. And we owe them a tremendous amount of gratitude. And I'm very thankful because my job is definitely a lot easier because of the very careful work that they uh, implemented during the 90s. 
And one of the things they did to the stucco, first thing they did was go around and they sounded the stucco with a, a wooden mallet, some type of mallet, to, to listen for hollow spaces. Any place that was hollow indicated that the stucco was delineating <coughs> from the substrate. It was in danger of completely falling off the building. Uh, this being such an important architectural feature of the house, they obviously didn't want this to happen, so this is how they protected it or, or re reattached it. They drilled holes in the stucco and they inserted epoxy, uh, made epoxy plugs into the holes, and this in effect reattached the stucco to the substrate, and then they filled the holes with, um, with a matching stucco on the outside. So if you look at the house today, you really pay attention, you'll see these little holes all over the building. And these are all areas where the stucco was in danger of completely falling off the building. The dentals, another interesting visual uh, investigation of the property. Uh, you can see this is an image before the 1990s project. I think this is actually Portland cement dental. Uh, they have been recreated over time. I think they've, they've fallen off the building and they're just held on by a masonry nail. Uh, and after in the 1990s they restored a lot of them. I think they removed a lot of the Portland cement, the, the, the repairs that didn't really fit the look of the building. And here it is afterwards. The dentals run along the belt course of the building. They're uh, an area that, that get a lot of um, a lot of biological buildup, a lot of mold and mildew, so they need a lot of careful attention. So today, I still, I, I keep a pretty um, stringent uh, maintenance uh, regime for the stucco. We, we have a good amount of money in our budget every year to address cracks and problems. I'd say 90% of what I do is fixing old cracks. The building, like I said, has a memory. It kind of fails in the same areas over time, so uh, we, we really stay on top of it. And here's an image, we, we do a lot of visual inspections of the buildings, and here's an image after Hurricane Matthew. Uh, this is 10 days after the hurricane, and if, if you recall, we had some very nice, warm, dry weather. 10 days later, we still have wet patches on the north side of the building. So we carefully recorded all these patches looked at the cracks. This, this informed us as to which cracks were superficial because there's cracks all over the building. This told us where we had more invasive cracks, that they weren't superficial. And after documenting and looking into this, um, John Ecker, Greg Jacobs, we, we had the, uh, we filled all these cracks and we did not have this problem with Hurricane Irma. We, there's still a couple places we need to address, but, but just really paying attention and looking at the building tells you a lot. Moving on to the hyphen at the back of the building. So what you're looking at here, this is the east facade of the building. Uh, these two pale colored uh, bays are the, an 1830s addition, and they were connected by what we, what's called a hyphen here. This area gets so much sun exposure. It's just it, beaten by the weather and the sun, so it needs a lot of attention. And here it is pre-restoration in the 1990s. Uh, this is clabbered siding. This was a 1910 edition, and underneath that you can see the original cypress siding from the 1830s edition. They removed all the clabbered siding and revealed um, not only the cypress siding, but the paint pattern, the pattern of the cypress. It was, it was uh, made to look like faux, faux stone. And they also uh, unveiled the recessed areas in the parapet, which they didn't realize continued all the way around the building. So here's a close-up of those recessed panels. They made steel forms uh, as part of the uh, restoration of those panels. And here's the finished product uh, with a very brave painter and about 40 feet up on, in, a, on, in the air on a very tiny ladder, putting the finishing touches on the building. So it turned out really beautifully. So I wanted to move a little further east on the property and talk about the garden. The garden is one of our only opportunities at all three of our sites to consider landscape preservation, which is a, a, a big field and, and a, a big topic of discussion in a lot of other museums, but we only have a small area where we can really think about it, talk about it. Here's the, the garden, probably in the 1950s, um, when the Talker Museum took over ownership of the house, uh, the garden was referred to as a junkyard in a slum. 
So they hired, in 1954, they hired a landscape architect, Ms. Claremont Lee, to guide the Owens Thomas House Garden Committee through the process of interpreting the grounds. Lee began with excavations in the overgrown yard that, to everyone's disappointment, yielded no evidence of a formal garden. So therefore, it was decided to create an imagined garden that would be, in Lee's words, an example of a 1820 Georgia-style Regency garden and a museum of plants which would have been available in Savannah during the 1820s. It will be an enhancement to William Jay's beautiful Regency architecture. So again, you see a marketing uh, idea here. I mean, the, the, the slum junkyard yard was not attractive to visitors. Um, but they hired Claremont Lee, uh, who was known for her, her historic gardens, to interpret the space for them. And she did a tremendous amount of research. So they didn't just willy-nilly plant a garden. They, they, she took about two years uh, researching um, <coughs> Regency Gardens at that time, there's a lot of correspondence to landscape architects in England and a lot of research to see what plants were available in Savannah in the 1820s. <coughs> and here's her design. Uh, there's some citrus, a lot of bulbs, a wisteria. I don't know how much of this, her, her plan was actually planted and I don't know how much of it, if any, survives. Uh, George Wilson is here and I'm sure he'll be happy to talk about it after in our reception afterwards, if you have some questions for him, he really knows the garden very well. But there were buildings in the way of Claremont Lee's design. So referring back to our original slide, you can see, uh, this is a zoomed in image of it, but you can see here along President Street where all the trolleys pull up, there's buildings. They're not buildings there now. So according to, these buildings were the, off, the office of Margaret Thomas's father, Dr. James Gray Thomas. And according to uh, Sanborn Fire Insurance maps, uh, this office was built just after the Civil War. Dr. Thomas, who was originally from Kentucky, was stationed in Savannah as a surgeon in the Confederate Army. This is where he met and married Margaret Thomas's father, Margaret Owens, M Margaret Thomas's mother, Margaret Owens. Among many accomplishments in the medical field, Dr. Thomas is credited with being instrumental in creating the uh, Sanitation Commission of Savannah in 1877 to help stop the spread of yellow fever and other diseases. Here's an image of the inside of the garden and what is, uh, was his office. Um, Margaret Thomas used this area as a garage after her father's passing. And here, uh, Claremont Lee stands with her assistant in the rubble of the offices, making notes and plans for her garden. Another picture of the, what was left of the offices from inside the garden. And here's Claremont Lee's completed garden. I think this is probably a year or so. It's grown in a little bit after, um, after it was completed. So the development of the garden demonstrates how editing an existing site to achieve a specific period of interpretation in an authentic manner, no matter how well researched and how well intended, can result in the loss of material history that may be regretted. However, the garden has become woven into the history of the house in its 60 plus years as a museum. Claremont Lee was a Savannah native and one of the first professional women to practice in the field of landscape architecture in the state of Georgia. She was a member of the American Society of Landscape Architects, and she is credited with spearheading the movement to prevent putting streets through the middle of our squares. So she was a very important figure. So for us to restore this garden to a working yard and restore or reconstruct Dr. Thomas's offices would also be a mistake. Our garden is one of the best surviving examples of a Claremont Lee garden. So we'll continue to the carriage house, uh, moving a little to the easternmost portion of the property. So again, we'll refer to our original slide. This is the only slide that I have been able to find that has a picture of the carriage house when it was still being used as a carriage house. It was turned into apartments in 1910 by Margaret Thomas. But if you look beyond the offices here, here is the carriage house. You can still make out the hayloft door. And it's pretty blurry, but there's a little arm and a pulley for hoisting the hay up to the hayloft. 
So when the Telfair took over the house and the, and the property, there was great concern among the Telfair board that the Owens Thomas House not become a financial liability to the institution. Hence, the decision was made to maintain the upper apartments in the main house and the two carriage house apartments. Board minutes from this time described the condition of the carriage house apartments as deplorable. <laughs> so they spent $10,000 on restoring the, what they called restoring the apartments. They replaced the slate, here's a, an image of it. Um, they replaced the slate roof with asbestos shingles roof, which was very popular in the 50s. They added new plumbing and electricity. I, I don't know if it was the first time it had plumbing or it was probably just an upgrade of plumbing. Here's the new plumbing. Front and center. <laughs> so then they re-rented the apartments, now calling them townhomes. <laughs> so this adaptive reuse of the carriage house's apartments proved to be an early cornerstone of financial stability for the museum. In fact, in 1956, just two years after the Owens Thomas House opened, board meetings state that the Owens Thomas House will be self-supporting in the not too distant future and may be able to contribute to the upkeep of the parent ed organization, the Telfair Museum of Art. So they hit the ground running and made some really smart decisions. And it's still a very beneficial relationship today. After that, there's really little mention in the board minutes of the carriage house until the 90s. Um, the 90s outlined plans for the apartments to be gutted. And they were going to be uh, replaced with an office space on the north portion of the carriage house and a, a orientation, orientation area and a gift shop on the south portion. They supported this decision, uh, saying that there was really, with the development of the part, apartments in the carriage house, there's really nothing of historic significance remaining. So here in this slide, you can see uh, where they have closed in the hayloft door, and they have opened uh, entrances to the uh, two apartments down here and filled in some other uh, areas that were open. And here's the 1990s <coughs> restoration. So the, in the 90s, they basically planned to restore the uh, building envelope to the original 1820s appearance. So they restored the hayloft door. You can see where these, the apartment uh, entrances were here and here, and they're restoring this back into windows. And this slide is, uh, I think it's probably one of those doorways that they're restoring back into a window. window. And you can get an idea of the thickness of this beautiful cavity wall here. So when the apartments were removed uh, in the 90s, what was uncovered was literally a showstopper. They were definitely wrong when they said nothing important remained of the original. They uncovered clear material evidence of the living quarters of the people who lived and worked on the property, the nine to 14 slaves that supported the lifestyles of the Richardson and Owens families lived in the, this part of the carriage house, which is now more accurately referred to as the slave quarters. These discoveries brought the plan for office space here to a complete halt, and a full-scale architectural study and documentation project was launched. Ghost marks indicating room divisions, staircases, Dark marks on the wall where evening candles regularly provided light, and many other discoveries were made. This gave Savannah and historians nationally rare insight to the lives of urban slaves. The most acclaimed discovery was the blue paint on the ceilings, considered by some historians to be the largest intact example of paint blue paint in the country. And if you don't know what paint blue paint is, it's a, a, a mixture of lime, buttermilk, uh, tinted with an indigo blue dye. And it was a popular in Gullah, Gullah and Geechee cultures to paint around doorways and window openings and on ceilings. And I've read two different ways that it was supposed to protect the home from paints or spirit, evil spirits. Um, it was supposed to ward them off. And I've also read that it was supposed to invite them in and usher them up through the ceiling, which was meant to look like a sky. So they would just pass right on through. Shannon, maybe you can do some clarification on what, what the direct meaning of it is. The, um, the blue paint was painstakingly restored. Um, this is a great, or, or conserve, this is a great example of conservation. So they basically, any place where the paint was uh, flaking, they would reattach it, and it's held up really well. If you go there today, um, it, it looks 
like it's in great shape, it's, it's, it's holding up really well. So the um, historic importance of the carriage house, and especially the slave quarters, finally get their due in the 1990s, mid-1990s, with the grand reopening of the carriage house. The discoveries in the carriage house and slave quarters inspire two decades of scholarly research, a two-day symposium, a book, and two federal grants to better understand the subject of urban slavery in this country. The Telfair will soon unveil exhibits to tell, them more, tell this more complete story of the home and the people who lived and worked there. And Shannon will again talk a little bit more about that when I'm finished. So you can see the care of historic properties is always evolving. As the team currently responsible for the Telfair Tree's iconic buildings, Jason and I carefully consider each project, each repair, each act of maintenance to arrive at the very best strategy for intervention. We endeavor to understand the history of decisions made on every building surface before we take action. The museum still uses preservation, conservation, restoration, and adaptive reuse at all three sites. Over the years, the field of preservation has matured, and people actually know about and know what I'm talking about when I say I'm a historic preservationist. This has not always been the case. And now SCAD's preservation department, where both Jason and I received our degrees, has morphed into preservation design. I think this ushers in an era where preservation is accepted and in many times preferred, so we don't have to make it claim its value anymore. Um, we, and we can now apply these informed and tested practices to creatively consider the use of preservation and use and preservation of historic structures. And with that, I'll invite Shannon up to talk about upcoming projects. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia and Jason, for a fascinating look back, um, and also for all your hard work. We certainly wouldn't have our buildings in such beautiful shape if it wasn't for what you do. I'd like to take a couple of minutes to give you a sneak peek of where the Owen Thomas <coughs> House is going from here. Our current project began with the National Endowment for the Humanities Consultation Grant in 2005, and has continued through planning, excuse me, Planning grants, uh, the symposium that Sonia referred to, as well as the publication of Slavery and Freedom in Savannah, and partnerships with Yale University and the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture. The current phase of this important project is the Owens Thomas House at the forefront of historic house museums in the country. It includes stabilizing walls and installing a state of the art HVAC system that will allow us to remove the existing ductwork in the basement, which you see in this image and can tell is not the most wonderful feature on our tours at this point. New exhibits in the basement will include a preservation gallery and an education gallery that will allow visitors to further explore the historical themes that they see on their, hear about on their guided tours. 